You're listening to the After the Show Movie Podcast from ascully.com. Your weekly look at movies, video games, and more brought to you by your hosts, A. Scully and Sitor. We're addicted to movies. Are you? Hello, Sitor. Welcome. I just want to be serious up front here before we start joking about. Okay. Um, I want to say, rest in peace, the Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of England, who died this week. Everybody knows that. Pretty sad. And you're not taking the piss. You actually like the Queen. (laughs) No, I'm not taking the piss. You know, it sounds a little sarcastic, so I'm just saying he actually really likes, not like, like you're not a royalist, but you appreciate what they mean in your country to you. Not everyone, but to you. I think it comes from growing up with my grandmother, who was a absolute royalist she drank her tea out of a cup with the queen's face on it if ever the queen was on tv she'd stop what she was doing and go and see it you know right she would go to see the buckingham palace things like that you know she was really into the queen so when the queen died it just made me think of my grandmother a lot oh well that's sad and nice at the same time yeah and then when king charles gave his speech yesterday and was talking about his mum, i was like oh my grandma would have hated today I mean, she would have hated the day the queen died. Sure. So that's what it brought back to me. But here's the reality. The queen didn't know your grandma existed. So a lot of people don't have any feelings about it whatsoever. Yeah, my grandma (laughs) didn't reach the age of 100, so she never got the letter from the queen. If you reach the age of 100 in England, you get a letter from the queen. Not anymore you don't. You get a letter from the king, but, you know. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. We'll see what he does. So we're starting a lot of podcasts recently with death, so... Well, that's part of part of it all. It's part of the universe. God bless the Queen and God bless Sid Talk. Mm, the God bless part. Not, <laughs> not <sure. laughs> Let's start off with controversy right off the bat. All right. Let's start off with this. I'm the doctor. The before right? the after the show discussion was me saying. Let's play this game. Okay. I'm the doctor. Okay. And you've come to see me. Go on. Tell me what doctor, you're Doctor, doctor. When I sit in this chair and wiggle around. My butt crack hurts really bad. You know why? Because I fell down the stairs this week. Okay. My um, recommendation is don't sit in that chair and wiggle (laughs) around. And two, don't fall down the stairs anymore. (laughs) Thank you. That is modern medicine at its very best. That's $10,000. Wednesday evening, I was going down to check to make sure the garage door was locked. And uh, I don't even know what happened. I literally just... I felt my one foot go out. I was about five. I was only on the second step. We have two sets of steps and they have like seven steps. I was on the second one going down and I just like my foot just disappeared. And then that foot fell under me and then the other knee twisted. And our stairwell is like a well, like it's two walls and a door at the end. So it's like I'm being falling into a very, a well, like an actual well. And then uh, I cracked my tailbone. I don't know if it's cracked, but it's very painful. You came running, turned the light on me. I'm laying at the bottom of the stairs. And you're like, are you okay? And I'm like, do I look okay? I'm like literally crumpled. You know that? Um, com- I mean, it's funny now. You know that commercial on TV where the old ladies fell down and she says, I've fallen and I can't yes. get up. It was literally that. I could barely get up, but I am finished my mission. The door was locked. And then I find out from you that you had confirmed it was already locked. So yeah, it was just a, a pointless uh, exercise. Pointless mission. And now I have a very sore muscles around the whole tailbone butt crack area. It's very painful. So I have no solution for anyone with this problem. Well, luckily I've looked up. I mean, I'm not debilitated, but I am telling you, you do not even know how much work those muscles do. Every cough, every laugh, even talking loud now, I can feel little shock waves of pain going down there. So you taking those. Muscles around your butthole, very for granted. There's another lovely way to start the show. This isn't about this. This is a movie podcast. And luckily, your butthole being sore doesn't affect your mouth. (laughs) So you can talk on the podcast because you don't talk from your butthole. Or do you? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Some would say that yes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. 
So what a way to start the show. Let's get on to the show. Yeah. It's Saturday, September the 10th. This is after the show. We're a movie review podcast. And on our 753rd episode, we're looking at the movie Thor, Love and Thunder. It's a 2022 movie. Releases on Blu-ray on September the 27th, but you can actually stream it right now on Disney+. Plus. It's PG-13 from our friends at Marvel and Disney who sent us a code for review. Sid Talk, can you give us the synopsis of Thor, Love and Thunder? It's another classic Thor adventure. And there's a woman Thor and... There's love and thunder. There's love and thunder and death and gods and action and comedy. Is that what's on the box? On the box it says, Thor enlists the help of Valkyrie, Korg, and ex-girlfriend Jane Foster to fight Gaw, the god butcher, who intends to make all gods extinct. Which is also correct. Well, don't be controversial for the sake of it. What did you think of Thor, Love and Thunder? I really enjoyed it. I cried. I laughed. I felt the adventure. I liked the way it looked. I liked the vibe. There are some very genuinely entertaining and thoughtful little moments tucked in there. I I enjoyed it. Yeah, I didn't expect the uh, thoughtful kind of life stuff. Because it's, it's pretty goofy, the movie, right? Thor is been notoriously sort of like, you know, superficially entertaining, correct? Like you got yeah. the brother relationship, you had Thor becoming the god that he is between, you know, the relationship between his parents and all that jazz. But I mean, didn't really dig very deep. But in this one, we have a person dying of cancer. We have the concept of love and being alone or feeling godless or let down by your beliefs in a god. That's a lot. That's pretty deep stuff, I think, to wrap it in sort of a very comedic thing. And uh, I liked it. Yeah, I think it pulled it off. Has the Marvel Universe covered the subject of somebody having cancer before? Because I can't remember it. Mm, I don't recall. It seemed kind of fresh to me. Like, I was like, oh, wow, we're dealing with real things. It might have been in the movie. We don't, I mean, in the comics, right? I don't know. Yeah, but not in the movies, I don't believe. I don't, Mm. that was sad. Because it opens pretty much on a sad moment too, doesn't it? I mean, it's sad, but it's dealt with in a very modern and I think honest way. Okay, we're going to spoil this. Jane Foster, who becomes She Thor, we're going to call her, even though she didn't like that. Just Uh, Thor. (laughs) No. Lady Thor. No, she's not Lady Thor. She is Thor. No, she's got a name. She said to him, if you can't say Mighty Thor, that's what she's named herself. Right. Mighty Thor. In the cast, she's just called Thor. We open with her sitting in a thing and finding out that she has cancer. She's doing chemotherapy. She's only told her assistant lady that we've met in previous movies. And she's like, don't you want to tell anybody? And she's like, no, because everyone acts weird. And I'm just going to do this. And all she wants to really do is get back to her work. And what she want, what her purpose to her is to do is the science that she does, right? So it's not, you don't feel this like, oh, it's sad. And yet you feel like right on, she's doing it. And she even says, I'm going to do it my way. And so I feel like that's a, it's a combo thing, right? Because yeah. someone in stage four cancer, yes, some people do get in remission after that. And a lot of people don't. And so you're instantly slammed with like, oh, this is supposed to be a fun Marvel movie. And oh, one of our lead characters is doing chemotherapy right in front of us. And might die. Yeah. I mean, also the body, it starts off with the body like crawling through what seems to be the desert. And we don't, we've never seen this body before. What's he called? Gore. I mean, he wasn't a baddie yet. He, was he wasn't a, a baddie yet, but yeah. he turns out to be the baddie of the movie. I would argue that. He's not the bad guy. Who's the bad guy? The thing that gets into his mind, the sword that appears, the shadow darkness thing whatever that is, gets into him, he wouldn't have done what he did without this, like, there's a sword and it's got some sort of shadow magic and it calls to him and then it, like, infects him. So he's basically a vessel for this terribleness and his hurt and his pain because, sadly, his daughter dies 
And then his God tells him, I don't care about you. Like, you're nothing. Like, we're talking fiction here, everyone. So just keep that in mind. Don't get all prickly about it. But he clearly has died and goes to where his God is. And his God says, I don't care about you. Like, I don't care. There will be more of you. It doesn't matter. You'll, there'll be more people to believe in me. You don't matter to me. He then gets very broken by this. This shadow mist magic comes from the sword, goes into him, and uses him, essentially. That is your bad guy. Yeah. Get bad thing, whatever. Starts off with this gore guy. Um, you see the death of his daughter. Mm -hmm. And you see this journey he's taken. And you see him lose his beliefs. And it's just very down at the beginning there, isn't it? You're like, wow, I didn't expect a, a Thor movie to open this way. Yeah, I was actually like, did you start the right movie? Because <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> and then the voiceover from um, Taika Waititi set is, is like, now let's tell the story of Thor. And he kind of, they kind of do the history of Thor a little bit. Lightens with, the mood. With all the fun moments. And, you know, the whole movie's tongue firmly in cheek. Apart from, I mean, the way we made it sound is it's some serious, you know, drama. But it is not, is it? It's very silly. Mm. It's very, I find funny. One thing I have with it is there's a lot of jokes. A lot of jokes, right? Always joking, 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 joking. I don't think they all hit. I think some do. I think some are funny. I think some are like, oh, God, you know, roll your eyes. What are you, the comedy police? Yes. Mm. <laughs> or maybe it's because they're constantly on a joke. Everybody's joking, right? There's a scene where they meet the gods in the middle of the movie, and they meet Zeus. And, like, everybody's cracking a joke. It's a bit too one too many jokes. That's mm. the only problem I had with. There are some funny jokes within all those cracker jokes, but... You know, it's coming at you like ping pong balls, <laughs> comedy ping pong balls. Yeah, but the, then the numbers are in your favor if you're the comedy writers, because something's going to be funny. Maybe you, that's the you, thing. You only throw one joke at you and it's not funny. Throw everything at the wall and hope one of them sticks. Correct. Yeah. But that's the method they're using for sure. There's crazy special effects. You go to crazy places. It reminded me a bit of Guardians of the Galaxy, the, the kind of scenery we were looking at, because we go to really weird areas of the universe let's say because since guardians of the galaxy appeared on our screens marvel movies have gone more into the cosmos and into the universe right instead mm -hmm. of just being on earth mm -hmm. and now i'm never surprised if we go to somewhere weird do you like all the uh, scenery do you like the cg in this movie i do i mean it has its moments of course like all things there are times when it's like mm, you know a little you want to blur your eyes just a little bit not always, though. I mean, I feel like once I've hit the balance of I'm enjoying the whole of it, then the little bits and pieces don't bother me as much. I go along for the ride. So They're flying a theme park built ship, like an old Norse Viking ship. No, I think they used her actual ship to make As the that, theme park ride. Yeah, her, it's her ship. Right. But they've converted it. Okay, so what we find out from other movies is Thor's planet was destroyed and there are a few as guardians as asgard is blown up and then a few as guardians survive they end up on earth they make their own little like corner of the world there you know i don't know where they are they're on the seaside and they've got like a combination of just what looks like normal earthly stuff and then all the as guardian stuff and it's a tourist destination where there are like well you've been to tourist destinations they've turned it into that so she's taken her actual ship and it's just sitting there, but it's been adorned as a tourist attraction with a bar inside and a little neon light and everything. And then when it's time, she just strips all that shit off and uses her ship. And two crazy giant goats. Um, <laughs> Screaming goats. Who scream. Terrible. Drag it. Terrifying. That's, it's insane and crazy. All it the same is. <laughs> and uh, there are parts where you're like... It's hilarious when they meet Zeus. I thought that was hilarious. Zeus's entrance and his weird demeanor. I mean, he's not that funny. I really liked it. I didn't expect it. And I didn't even know that Russell Crowe, who plays Zeus, was in it. Did you? Mm. Uh, no, but it didn't add anything for me whatsoever. Well, I did quite a lot for me, that middle mm. sequence. One more thing I might have a problem with is a lot of Marvel movies kind of end the same way. It funnels down to the bad guy and our hero is in the same room and there's a fight. True. Now, one that did diverge from that quite a bit was 
What was the first one that? Oh, it was the original Doctor Strange. Do you remember that? Where it wasn't. It was him fighting in space, basically, like all the way through space and time. Right. That one was kind of different, but I find that we kind of get funneled in Marvel movies and we end up in a very small space with the bad guy and the good guy and they're going to hit each other. And that's usually what it was. <laughs> and the scale is smaller than you would like. Smaller than I would like and hitting each other. It's less satisfying the more I see it. What would you like? What would you like us to tell Marvel and have them take some notes so that you are satisfied? Bigger scope. Okay, you need to be specific. Multiverse. <laughs> no. No, be specific. I don't know specific. I'm not a writer, obviously. Um, so then what they would say is then you don't have, you are not entitled. Well, fair to enough. Tell I'm us not what entitled. to do. <laughs> so just keep, ma- Marvel, just keep making a little room and have them it's in each other. That's fine. <laughs> It wasn't a little room. It was like a chamber, a big giant chamber that was right outside of eternity because this is where we're headed in the movie. So this guy can go to eternity, ask for his biggest wish, which is that all gods be dispatched with. Right. So it's a giant room with big statues. And, you know, so it's not a little it's not like they're fighting in the in a train car like Mr. Bourne or Mr. Bond have done in the past. Maybe that's it. You just you figured it out. You're the you're the top writer. I am. So the next Marvel movie, it needs to all the action happens and then it funnels it down and the end scene is them fighting in a train car. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. And you'll be like, wow, that was different because we've never seen that small space. How if we just put them in a UFC cage? Yeah. Ultimate fighting. Just put them in a big cage every single time. Like we have in Doctor Strange, right? Those big bat, those fights that they have. Abomination was in the Yes, ring. just do that at the yeah. end of every <laughs> That's where it all goes. We just need to wrangle all the people, stick them in there, and let it all happen. Because it's all based on comic books, and comic books usually end in two people fighting, and then I understand that it's a kind of a thing. But you can do anything, can't you, in a movie? Absolutely. And obviously I'm not the person to hire because I can't think of anything else, but <laughs> and neither can they. I am out of ideas. <laughs> yeah. So overall, I really enjoyed it. I like the atmosphere. I like the music. I like the comedy here and there. I really like this. You wouldn't call him the bad guy, the protagonist. I really like him. Yeah. When we go into the castle, I'll explain why. Overall, I... Quite liked it, but I do like Ragnarok, the last one, the best out of all the Thor movies still, because it was the first time Thor, it went really insane all over the galaxy, because it was pretty grounded before that. We had the first Thor movie. Hold on. Grounded? Well, not grounded, but we had the first (laughs) Thor movie, like, mostly on Earth, and it was like the comedy of, oh, here's a guy who's never been to Earth, so it's kind of funny. And then the second one was on Asgard, and it was all Asgard mostly. Ragnarok just went everywhere, and it was insane and crazy. And this one follows suit, but I just liked Ragnarok a lot. So that's how I stand with my ranking of Thor movies. Got it. So let's get on to the cast. Chris Hemsworth plays Thor again. What did you think? Same as always. He loves it, by the way. I've seen interviews with him. Thor's is he's born to play it, he says. <laughs> So long as they want him, he will keep doing Thor because he loves it. But um, that's what Danny Dyer said about EastEnders. And now, I mean, can you compare Danny Dyer to? I'm saying Chris what these performers have said about a role that they have been stepped into or been given, you know, by whatever reason. And they're like, this is it. This is my retirement job. And then it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Chris Hemsworth could retire from his Thor money now, probably, right? And that's. And not just Thor. I mean, he's got, I mean, strangely, if a lot of people don't know this, but he was in uh, Cabin in the Woods. Oh, yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> that was released after his first kind of big thing, remember? And we were like, why is he in this? But it had been made like two years before that. Yeah, it got like shelved for a while. If you haven't seen Cabin in the Woods, it's fun. And we will not spoil it. It is fun. Horror movie. Good. Yeah, but it's fun. It's a fun, fun flick. Definitely a um, high recommendation. But go in knowing nothing. Don't watch the trailer. Just go and watch it. Yeah, just watch it. Don't, like, look it up or anything. Don't even listen to us talk about it. No. So uh, Natalie Portman plays Jane Foster. You know, the last time we saw Natalie Portman as Jane Foster, which movie was it? Don't know. I was having a hard time remembering. Don't even know. I feel like it was the first Thor movie, 
possibly, because she's been missing for a while. So what did you think of her in this one? She was good. I mean, I always, I'm always compelled by her. I don't even, you know, in the word, because I have sort of a thing for, you know, her earliest role that we know her from. And I think I'm just always a little bit blinded by that. She's pretty awesome. <laughs> well, you're combining all of your movie experiences with yeah. her because you love Leon or the professional. You love Star Wars and you just love, you've fallen in love with her over the years. The issue I had with her in this one, but you know, when they did like the montage of like when Thor was falling in love with her, mm -hmm. she was kind of the same age as she was now. Yeah. They didn't mess with that at all. <laughs> it was a bit uncomfortable. I was like, why is she like 50 <laughs> when he's supposedly fell in love with her? How many years ago? At least eight, eight years ago. Yeah. They didn't really bother to make her look younger. I think we're over all that stuff. We're just going to assume she was. But she was awesome, and the sad parts, which we talked about earlier, they're really pretty moving. Christian Bale puts his all into it as gore. Christian Bale is one of those actors who, when I'm watching him, I can tell it doesn't matter what he's playing, even if it's a Marvel character or whatever, and people think, oh, that's not a serious role. It's a serious role to him. Yeah, he's all in. Yeah. And he's, his heart and soul is in it. And you can't tell him otherwise. <laughs> I mean, he, he was, at the beginning when his kid died, from that point onwards, I could feel the pain in him. Yeah. So I feel that that is A plus for acting. I'll give you a gold star, Mr. Christian Bell. He'll tell you to fuck off, but whatever. Say what? <laughs> what did you say? He'll tell you to fuck off because he doesn't care. Oh, yeah, he probably would giving yell him at gold me. Star. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're being very close-minded because he has notoriously been in that one single time when he was throwing a little bit of a fit on the set. and uh, I don't blame him for that. He wasn't happy with somebody being a sh shithead while he was trying to work. Listen to you, diva, diva supporter. <laughs> yeah. We've got Tessa Thompson as King Valkyrie. What do you I, think of Tessa? I always like her. I think I always like her because, of course, we just watched her in Westworld and I really like that character. She's very different to the Westworld person. In Westworld this. person does not have a sense of humor. No. This lady, I mean, she's a robot, essentially, in Westworld who has sentient powers now. And she becomes like the god of the world. You have to watch Westworld. Just do that. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a good one. In this, she's just pretty much constantly funny, but you know she's a badass. So I like her. She's also a bit sad. Yes. Because of how her life has turned out with the relationships and everything. They've taken Asgard, the survivors, put them in this place that's now like a, like she's a showpiece because she's the king. And now she has to like shake a lot of hands and do a lot of politicking and public things that just seem kind of ridiculous, like a king or a queen would in modern world instead and of she like just wants going, to be out going there. to battle. Yeah. yeah, she wants to just go kill something. So Russell Crowe plays Zeus. It's a... I'm not a fan. I'm a big fan of this Zeus performance. It was hilarious to me. Um, some of the lines he had were brilliant. I just found it kind of, like, I get it. It's just this, like. But it seemed even overly cartoony for this movie, which is very weird. I don't know. I'm on the other side of being, like, that was just a really funny scene. And Russell Crowe's really hamming it up, obviously. Yeah. And I think he was hamming it up in the right way because I was laughing at him, which was the idea. I mean, I love the concept, which is what was funny to me. But I, I guess I'm, I don't know. I'm over Russell Crowe. Finally, the Guardians of the Galaxy make an appearance. So all of the Guardians are, are here. For Except, Except for Zoe. What's her face? Yes. Yeah. Zoe Saldana is not there. But they're all here and they all, you know, stick around for 10 minutes. So if you like the Guardians. They didn't all speak. So don't, except I like Damie Pond or whatever her name is in that. Yeah. If you don't watch Doctor Who, you don't know what I'm saying. So directed by Taika Wakiki. I still say that wrong every time. Watiti, let's say. He uh, directed Eagle vs. Shark, which is a really underrated small movie from New Zealand that everybody should watch. It's very funny. Flight of the Concords directed a bunch of those episodes. What We Do in the Shadows, remember that movie? Very funny. There's also a TV series of that now. And he directed episodes of The Mandalorian, which uh, most recently, and the other Thor Ragnarok movie. What do you think of him as a director? I feel like it's sort of on a track 
because he's into comedy, that that, of course, is going to leak through and that I feel like his standard and expectation to keep up the energy and make it funny, even in the saddest moments. And, you know, I feel like that's his contribution. And then dealing with the juggernaut of being directing a Marvel movie, right? I mean, that's just a system that's already in place. You are just the, what's the guy called at the front of the orchestra? Conductor. The conductor, or as we actually call them, the director. (laughs) I think he's fine. I mean, I don't know how it would be different if someone else would do Well, he also plays a character called Korg, which is an awesome character, and it's full of Taika's... It's awesome, but he's also just being just like Groot. It's full of Taika's personality, though, isn't it? Like his actual Flight of the Concords style humor. But I like him as a director, and I like him in that role as well. And something really surprising happens to Gore in this movie. It was kind of interesting. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's like Groot. Yeah. I mean, you know. So IMDb reviews, what are those? Well, there's a website called imdb.com. And on that website, anyone on the planet, and I mean any human being or other creature who has the ability to type letters on a keyboard and then hit the button that sends it, can put a review of any of the items on the internet moviedatabase.com. You like to pick the ones where the creature has hit the one star. So there you go. Right. So these are the people who didn't like this movie. And the first person says, the whole movie was full of quirky fantasy, Book Rogers style context. And you should never blend Nords and Greek gods together with religious themes. Did you do any research? (laughs) Because it's an actual... Yeah. There are rules? Maybe uh, you'll get struck down if you blend the two. I don't know. This guy says, this was a disappointing movie. I'm a huge MCU fan, but this is just a joke. It's a parody of Thor, and it cannot be compared to Thor movies. Mm. Well, it can, because it's a Thor movie. That's a pretty common review right there. And finally, Marvel films have never been for a smart audience, but turning a character like Thor and the others into a Clash of the Titans rom-com rarely seals the fate of this MCU. There really is nothing new here except for Thor's butt and penis, which normally is never asked for. Normally. (laughs) That's a really... I I actually like reviews. The best reviews are the ones that sound like they... I don't know what they were trying to say. (laughs) Like you'd like to call up the person and be like, okay, just clarify for me. I'm not criticizing. I just don't understand what you're What do you mean by Thor's button penis, which (laughs) normally is never asked for? What does that... How do you know it's not asked for? Is there a standard we're unaware of? Yeah. Where it is? I don't know. All right. So extras, there are a bunch of extras on the streaming version, including a gag reel. Sid Tart loves a gag reel. I don't. I think it's really stupid. So let's give Thor Love and Thunder a score. I am going to give Thor Love and Thunder a 7 out of 10. I think that's fair, but I'm giving it a 7.4. All right. I don't do the points. Unless it's a very special occasion and I feel like it. But not this time. I mean, I can't help it if you are not as good as me at scoring things, but that's just the way it is. All right. So thank you to Disney and Marvel for letting us watch Thor Good Thor Good and Thunder. Thor Love and Thunder. <laughs> and Good and Thunder. Good and Thunder. Good and Thunder. Yeah. So next week, we're going to look at the new movie Fall. Do you know that one? Fall, like F-A-L-L? Yeah. Seeing as it's nearly fall, we'll watch a movie called Fall. I don't. Well, there you go. Next week, you'll know what it's all about. Movie recommendations, I am going, you know, on the theme of Fall, Love and Thunder. I would go with Leon, The Professional. It's the first Natalie Portman role. I am not surprised at all. It's a brilliant movie. I think it still holds up, and Natalie Portman is incredible in it. It's in the world and time frame of true romance, you know? There's like this severe violence and deep-seated human stuff going on with a bit of grit and you know what I mean yes and Luc Besson who directed Leon followed that up with what did he follow it up with um Fifth Element yes so he was on a roll back there wasn't he I mean they're unrelated they're unrelated but I get but what you're bo- well the only relation is Gary Oldman 
True. And Luke Besson, of course. And he played a very unhinged person in both yeah. of them. <laughs> <laughs> and my other one is uh, thinking of Taika Wakiki, Watiti, Wakiki, Flight of the Concords, because he directed several of the episodes. It's a fantastic show. If you've never seen it, it's from New Zealand. It's on HBO, so you can stream it on HBO Max. It's two seasons. It's a comedy show about two musicians trying to make it in New York City. It's just very funny. So what are your um, movie recommendations? My recommendations are going back to the 90s. I believe I'm in 1995. Did you just turn into a robot? These have no, (laughs) no reflection of quality of any kind. And some of them I don't remember fully, but I know that I've watched them. And if you want to argue with me about I do. Come on. The, the, the quality of that uh, recommendation, I don't give a shit. Let's go. So, number one, you can just fight with yourself about it. Number one is Heat, which at the time was a big deal because Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. It's still a big deal. Is it? Yes. If you look, if you look back, is it? See, sometimes you look back on a movie and you're like, ooh, it was all like, ooh, ooh. And then you're like, oh. So, watch at your own risk. 12 Monkeys, which I happen to really like and remember fondly. Balto, which is also very fun. Animated movie about a dog. Dead Man Walking. Oh, very dark. Sean Penn. That will trigger a lot of controversial conversations. And that's what it was for. And uh, Mr. Holland's Opus, as Linda likes to call it, Mr. Old Man's Penis. (laughs) That'll be Linda Belcher from Bob's Burgers. Well, that sounds immature. (laughs) All right. And that's it. All right. Ace Gully stuff. I've been playing one game this week. It's called Destroy All Humans 2 Reprobed. Right on. So, what Destroy All Humans 2 is, it's a remake of a game from the Xbox 360 era. It was one of the first kind of open world type games, and it uses like the Mars Attacks kind of vibe. So, it's about aliens invading Earth. And this takes place in the 1960s. And it's got that goofy flying saucer, big head aliens vibe. And you're one of those aliens who comes to Earth. And it's like an open world game, like Grand Theft Auto, really. And you take place in a bunch of missions of you just basically killing off the human race as an alien. These aliens that come that you're one of, you can actually mind control people. You can get inside people's bodies and be them. So some missions are like you have to like possess somebody, then be them, and then just go and do a thing without anybody noticing because you're just a regular person. But then there are other missions where you you got to get in your flying saucer, fly over the whole map, and just like wreak havoc on the human race by burning them all, using laser beams, making them shrink with shrink rays. You know, it's got that crazy Tim Burton-y type vibe to it okay and the reason they've remade it is if you tried to play the original game which came out on the 360 it was plagued with like technical issues it didn't run very well because they were trying to be too ambitious for those days well now they've upped it to 4k it's 60 frames per second it's on the playstation the xbox and the pc and now it runs like it should have run in the first place they just couldn't do it back then and it brings a lot to it. It's very funny. There's a lot of extras now. Like you can, there's like hundreds of different little costumes you can get for your alien. And it plays on the 1960s a lot with like hippies, the end of the 60s, hippies and like government, pol- you know, politicking and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's Destroy Whole Humans 2, reprobed. You see what they did with the reprobed? Got it. Got it. Yep. And you can pick it up on Xbox, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, PC. It's available now. Sid Talk, what's for dinner? That's a good question. It says imp on my thing. Imp means impossible whopper. That's what you chose earlier, and so that's what we do. And what's your advice? Um, Well, this movie kind of brings it up, but also the recent... You know, sadness in my family and just thinking about the world in general and life and humanity, you know. I'm not a person who has any religion or gods or beliefs of any kind. And if you want to argue about that, too. It is corny that Thor says the only thing that matters is love. No. 
Yes, because I don't believe love is the thing. It's like there is a thing in us that makes us feel right, makes us not feel alone. But then there, in the absence of the thing, it's almost as if you are utterly alone. There is nothing else and there is no meaning and there is nothing, right? When this thing is absent or you perceive it to be absent, it isn't always. And I I would argue that it isn't ever, but. And it isn't love because like we've invented love. It's an idea. We've labeled these feelings, this thing, what we do, what. Love is one kind of this thing that I'm talking about, which is connection. There is a connection between humans and each other and the ground we walk on and the universe around us and then back to each other again. And it doesn't matter what the connection is. I like to prefer the productive, helpful, like supportive, keep moving forward, inventing things, creating things, solving problems kind of connection with each other and in the world around us. That's what I think it is. You know, I'm not a people person, so I don't, I'm not ever. And people can say, oh, well, surely that's not true, right? I get this condescending bullshit. When I say, I don't like going around people. I don't love family gatherings. I don't love gatherings in general. I have some exceptions. I love my class reunion people. It's one of those, like, it's separate from every other experience I have with people in the whole of the world. I can accept that one. But gatherings and touchy-feeliness and I don't like hugs and I'm over the whole bullshit of people claiming it's because something's happened or not happened or I'm just kidding myself or I'm trying to be tough. No, I actually am not. The love crap is not my thing. I love people like you, Mr. A. Scully, and my family and my friends. For me, feeling meaningfulness in the whole of life and the universe is just being connected to someone, something. It could just be that I grew a plant that made this crazy looking flower on it, right? That's a connection to a process that I've done and then I've It was nothing, and now it's a thing. It's the painting that I'm working on in there. It's learning the photography. It's, you know, to then be able to take pictures of people that matter to them. It's not because I'm in love with love and togetherness. It is a connection between us that kind of propels us forward, you know, builds you up, staying connected in any way, even if you're like a hermit. And your connection is that that's who you are. And once a month you go down to the store or people only know that you stay at home all the time, but you exist in a way that reflects something to them and people care about you and you care about them, but you don't have to be in love with everybody and join everybody, right? You're just connected to a community or a place in a different way. Like you exist and you matter and it isn't love, you know, it's a bit corny. So. That's it. All right. So you didn't like Thor's Thor's corniness. I didn't mind it because I understand a lot of people have that. They think that that's the baseline. Every poem and song and book and, you know, fictional thing. We all just keep pointing at the idea of love being at the center. And that's fine because we all have individual humans. We can't all have the same feelings for every human on the planet. Right. So when we have a special connection. See where I'm going? I see. It can feel overwhelming. Like there's nothing like it, right? So that's our love. Or like for your children, which I don't have, or your for your parent or your sibling or your nieces and nephews, your lifelong friends, who whatever, whatever the connection is you have with individual humans or your your group at your church or whatever, like you feel this overwhelming sense of that they matter to you and you don't want them to be absent and you don't want them to have harm and you want to protect or be a part of it. You know, you can label that love. Parts of it is. I just think it's that you're not just floating aimlessly out into space with no connection to anything, right? You're connected. All right. Thank you very much. Ascoli.com is the website you can go and feel the love there. (laughs) <laughs> you can actually get this podcast on anchor.fm slash after the show, your Spotify, Google podcast, iTunes, Amazon podcasts, anywhere podcasts are available. We're on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, 
I'm A Scully, she's Sid Talk. You can also email feedback to me, A Scully, A Scully.com. Do not email Sid Talk. She doesn't want any of your email or your I'm shit. not connected. I'm not connected to anything or no. anybody. And stay classy. Let's give the classy to Queen Elizabeth II of of England. Stay classy, Mom. Ah. I'm going to say think for yourself, because if you're not doing it, somebody's doing it for you. <laughs> <laughs>